It's a beautiful day. It's good to see all of you. Why don't you guys join in with me as we sing praise and thank God for the grace and the mercy that He gives us every day so free. On your feet, join in with me. You know it. Come on. Amen. Keeping up with the daily readings in God's grand story and reading through the New Testament with us, then yesterday you read in Mark chapter 15, verse 37, that Jesus breathed his last breath. But the story doesn't end there. Thankfully, Jesus not only died on the cross, but he rose again. And because of that, you and I can be set free from the slavery to sin. Y'all can go ahead and have a seat. Welcome to Dogwood Church. We are so glad you're here. My name is Lindsay Bryant, and I'm the Director of Guest Services here at Dogwood. Whether you're joining us in person or the beautiful weather on the patio or joining us online, we're just glad you're here today. If you're new to our church, uh, we would love to connect with you, and there are a few different ways that you can do that. The first is by grabbing a Connect card out of the chair pocket in front of you. Fill that out and drop it in the box or in the baskets later in the service. You can also text connect to the number on the screen, or if you're joining us on Facebook, you can just click the link in the comments section. If this is your first time, I would love to personally meet you. So if you'll bring your connect card to the guest services desk in the lobby, uh, we've got a free gift for you. So sorry to stand you back up again, but we're gonna continue to worship the King of Grace. Church. Let's confess that Jesus is Lord together. Let's celebrate the miracle of the gospel. Hallelujah. Every voice join in as we sing.
love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. And I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do.
mighty river come and fill me again. We are going to continue to worship God through the giving of our tithes and offerings. So y'all can go ahead and have a seat. As you prepare to give, I want to update you on how God is using our church in global missions. Over the last five years, the Dogwood Global Missions Team, missions team has focused our church's efforts in Bogota, the capital city of Colombia. We have trained and equipped churches to be more effective in fellowship, discipleship, ministry, evangelism, and worship. At Dogwood, we call those five purposes belong, grow, serve, share, and worship. And this week, we have a team of six people in Bogota starting a new round of training um, with a new group of churches. The team will lead training across five regions in Bogota with the potential for up to 600 new churches to be involved in that training. Uh, we will send a team every few months to continue that training over the next nine months. So let's celebrate what God is doing in Colombia right now. It's huge. We can do this in part because you give generous offerings to God as an act of worship every week through Dogwood Church. So we're gonna do that again right now. And there are several ways that you can do that. You can text GIVE to 770-285-1792. You can hit the GIVE button in the Dogwood Church app, automate your giving through your bank, or as we pass the baskets later in the service, you can give in person or at the black boxes on the way out. Um, as we prepare to give, let's pray for our team in Bogota as we also commit these offerings to God. Lord, we lift up our team in Colombia. We pray for their safety as they serve the people of Bogota. May they be an extension of Dogwood Church as they love you and love people and ultimately add numbers to your kingdom. Let us also remember, O oh Lord, that riches and honor come from you, and you are the ruler of everything. Power and might are in your hand, and it is in your hand to make great and give strength to all. Lord, you give us the ability to gain wealth. You richly provide us with all things to enjoy. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your name. But who are we that we should be able to give as generously as this? For everything comes from you, and we give you only what comes from your own hand. All this wealth that we give comes from your hand. Everything belongs to you. Help us to give joyfully and willingly with an upright heart. In the name of Jesus, our God and Savior, we pray. Amen.
Hi, everybody. Join me as I uh, lead us in a few moments of prayer, please. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray to you because you are our hope. And we trust that what you say in your word, the Bible, is true, that you hear us when we pray, and that you do some things when we pray that you don't do when we don't pray. And so as an act of faith and an act of humbling ourselves, admitting that you are God and we are not, uh, that we need you. Uh, We need you individually. We need you corporately. We need you globally. And so, Lord, it is still with shock and horror that we have witnessed the devastating violence and loss of life in uh, Israel and Gaza over the recent days. Lord, we're tired of this. And I'm concerned that I may be too used to this, getting these reports. From the Ukraine, now from Israel, from over 32 countries where there's some form of armed conflict going on. We come to you as the source of all comfort. We come asking that you send your Holy Spirit to surround and uphold all those who are grieving, all those who are suffering, all those who are afraid and in fear, all those in captivity, all of our own Dogwood family members who have family and friends in Ukraine, in Israel. Uh, in, in some of these other countries where there's great conflict, we pray. Lord, we pray that your mighty arms of comfort and compassion would one day overwhelm the arms of war. And we come to you as the source of all peace, not only comfort, but peace. You, the Prince of Peace, asking that you send your Holy Spirit to strengthen and uphold all, all of your peacemakers, all of those who are pursuing an end to violence and war, embolden those with a heart for justice and truth and peace and reconciliation. Amplify the voices of wisdom and restraint, we pray. May the light of your peace and reconciliation one day ultimately overwhelm the darkness of destruction. So, Lord, not only do we come to you as our source of all comfort and all peace, but you are the source of all hope. Lord Jesus, we who are your followers here, uh, we put our hope in you and ask that you send your Holy Spirit to bring about a future where neighbors embrace despite their differences where your love conquers hate, where evil is overcome by good, where humility surpasses pride, where the lion lays down with the lamb. Lord, and may you hasten the day that we Christians hope for in your word describes when you will return and make all things new, all things new. Where, you, where the day will come when we will study war no more, as the prophet said. And implements of, of war and weapons will be beaten into plowshares and tools of reconciliation and, and uh, peace. May it, be, may it be realized soon. May you come quickly, Lord Jesus, and, and hasten that day when there will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old things have passed away, and you have made all things new. Thank you, Lord Jesus, and it is in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. (coughs) 
Well, Jesus rescued me. Did he rescue you? Did he? You remember that day? You remember that day when you realized that? Most of you in this room, no doubt, uh, are, you're already a, you're not a lost person. You are a found person. I once was lost, but was blind, but now I see. You know, it's not fun to be lost. Uh, Allison and I, on a beautiful October uh, afternoon, about this time of year in 1982, 41 years ago, she was at she was expecting that little girl that just sang a moment ago. Uh, we were, uh, uh, we were uh, on a short section of the Appalachian Trail on the top of Blood Mountain. Uh, taking, now don't, don't be too impressed. Short day hike. Some of you guys actually enjoy hiking. You know, I, I, my, my, my wonderful wife enjoys hiking, but, and I like being with her, so we'll... But, you know, get out and walk long distances and up steep hills so that you're tired <laughs> when you have, like, cars. <laughs> but anyway, we were on, we were on, the, we were on a, sec, a beautiful section of the Appalachian Trail. Beautiful blue sky day, about 58 degrees, uh, the, uh, a breeze was blowing. All the trees were, were golden and uh, crimson. And uh, uh, the wind was blowing and the leaves were... It just looked like it was raining color up there. And I was enjoying it so much until I realized that so many leaves were coming down that they covered up the trail. And we, I, Lindsay, I could... We, we lost the trail uh, only for a few minutes, about 15 minutes. And then we found our way, but for 15 minutes, I was very uncomfortable, <laughs> very uncomfortable. Uh, had, have you ever been lost? It's, it's a terrible feeling. You know, it's also possible to be lost from God. It reminds me of an encounter uh, of Jesus that we find recorded in the gospel of Luke chapter 15. You may want to turn there. Uh, for example, on Friday of this week in our read the New Testament through passages, you're going to read this chapter on Friday, the, October the 20th. I'm going to give you a preview today. And so today we're diving into this, uh, this chapter. Your sermon notes are on pages 37 and 38 in your booklet. If you didn't uh, pick up one when you came in today. Now, uh, as we dive into this chapter, there are two groups of people represented here. Both of them are lost to a relationship with God. One of them is surprising. It is a religious group of lost people, very religious, represented by the Pharisees and the scribes. And the other is an irreligious lost people uh, who, who thought they were beyond hope until Jesus showed up. Read along with me, beginning in verse one. Uh, you follow along, I'm gonna read aloud. This is God's word. <clears throat> All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him. And the Pharisees and scribes were complaining. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the 99 in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it. When he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together saying to them, rejoice with me because I found my lost sheep. I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. Now, he's talking about righteous people in Jesus' mind are defined by people who already had repented and been made right with God. They didn't have to do that again. Or he goes on to say, what woman who has 10 silver coins, each representing, by the way, one day's wage, we'll come back to that, <clears throat> 
If she loses one coin, does not light a lamp. It's, it's dark, it's nighttime. And sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me because I found the silver coin I lost. I tell you, in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. He also said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So, he, so he's, he's doing a terrible thing. He's treating his father as if he was dead. I don't care about you. I'm going to act like you're dead. I want my inheritance now. So he, the father, distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. Now that, that, that statement had a much greater impact on good, faithful uh, Jewish uh, a good faithful Jewish audience than it does on us Gentiles who can't wait for church to be over to go to the barbecue joint. <laughs> he longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food and here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up, go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have Sinned in, against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fatted calf and slaughter it. And let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now, the Lord Jesus, <clears throat> with three parables, uh, a, very, a very Jewish rabbi way of teaching a point, with three parables, Jesus taught both of the groups, the religious lost group and the irreligious lost group, what it was like, that how people could be lost to a relationship with God and how they could be found. And again, we, we find uh, this was a great method of teaching, uh, Jesus often had a one-point sermon and he would illustrate it, boom, 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 with three consecutive parables and uh, illustrations to drive home the point. And that's what he does with you and me uh, here today. And he, so he says, uh, here's how we can become lost and, and how we get lost. Uh, we become lost, first of all, because we're like a lost sheep. We're like a lost sheep. You know, we're often compared, again, remember from just a few weeks ago, we're often compared in the Bible to, to sheep. In Isaiah uh, chapter 53, verse 6, it says, we all went astray like sheep. We all, everyone gets lost from God like sheep. We have all turned to our own way. Our own way is what gets us in trouble. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25, uh, it tells us, for you were like sheep going astray. Every, hey, all of you found people that celebrated a few moments ago. Remember, we were, were people. We were like sheep who had gone astray. Everybody, everybody at one time in their life is at least lost, at least, uh, and some remain that way. Uh, we're hoping to reduce that number uh, of people who are lost. So how do we get lost? What does it mean to, to be a sheep? Well, we become lost from God because we are ignorant of the things of God 
And we're also foolish, do foolish things. Now you said, are you saying we're dumb or stupid? No, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm saying they're very, we're, most of us are like, you know, like me, you're educated far beyond your intelligence. Uh, so we, we're small. I mean, you know, it's not that we're being intelligent and ignorant are two different things. Being ignorant just means you don't know. You just haven't learned that yet. It's okay to be ignorant. It's just not okay to stay that way, especially when it comes to God. Well, we get lost from God because we're ignorant of God and his ways. And then also because we are foolish, you know, some very, very bright people do very, very foolish things. I'm not very bright, but I have been foolish in my life. It means I, I do things where they're not, I'm not, we tend to not be wise and we get lost from Jesus, our good shepherd. Also by following other lost people, following the crowd. Sometimes sheep would get lost because it would follow other sheep who were lost. Well, uh, that's what peer pressure does to us. I don't, Randy, I don't know if this is true. I've never been able to nail down the source of the story, but I'm going to tell it anyway, like it was. How's that? Um, I, I had a friend who lived in South Florida all of his life, and, and so he hung around the, uh, the marine biology world, and he was telling me that at one of the big aquariums, again, I'm try, I've been trying to document this, Jim, for years. I can't find the documentation on it. But anyway, he said some of the, the marine biologists were trying to uh, learn about the schooling effect of fish. You ever seen the, you know, the big, the, the, those the wonderful documentaries about our planet that have all those, all the nature and wildlife and the beautiful uh, colors and the, the ones that deal with undersea life. And you see these massive schools of fish all turning in the same direction all the time. You ever seen, has anybody else seen that? But, okay. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Help me. Help me here. And so he said they were studying that schooling effect of fish. And so they took one of the fish out of the, they had a big tank and they took one of the fish out of the tank and they did brain surgery on the, that one fish. They took a portion of the, just a little portion of the brain out of that fish. And so, and they put him back in the tank. And so all the other fish are, they're doing their nice, almost acrobatic um, ballet type swimming around and he was going ear, 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 bonk down to the bottom and ear, 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 up to the surface and they kept observing him and over time a large section of the school were going ear, ear, ear. they were following the one with half a brain reminds me of when I was in middle school Got the point? Okay, let's move on. Sometimes we get in trouble because we, we're lost from God because we're following people with half a brain. And uh, here we go. And so, but also we get lost from God because we're like a lost coin. Now this coin was lost to this lady. It was lost in the dark, maybe in some dark corner, out of the way spot, down there in the darkness. It speaks of our ignorance. Again, our ignorance of God and the things of God. We can't see. We're in the dark. We're lost to, uh, to him. Um, this, is, this is a special, uh, a tragic temptation of uh, highly moral and ethical people, even sometimes religious folk who get God wrong. Remember, it's easy. Let's just talk, let's not talk about other world religions. Let me talk about those who claim to be Christians. Uh, it's very easy to misunderstand and wrongly follow Jesus. We think we got it right, but we're still apart from him. That's why in some of his uh, words later in his ministry to some people, he said, there are many who will come to me and say, uh, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these wonderful things in, in your name? And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. Religious people who got it wrong. So be careful. Be careful here. Uh, it's especially difficult for highly moral and ethical people, firstborn rule followers, 
Anybody a firstborn rule follower in your home? Yep, bet you are. Yep, bet I was one of those. And um, very hard for them to see their need to be saved. Like the scribes and Pharisees in this story. Like a lost coin. We get lost to God because we're like a lost sheep. We're like a lost coin. Also because we're like a lost son. He was lost to his father because he was rebellious. He didn't want to be under his father's rule any longer. That's how we get lost from our heavenly father. Well, what's it like? What, what's the problem with being lost? Well, the problem was, first of all, with spiritual ignorance like a sheep is that we're in danger of perishing. That lost sheep was in danger of perishing, not finding enough water, not finding enough food or the right food, um, exposed to the elements, uh, not having a safe sheepfold to sleep in at night, being exposed to uh, uh, predators that could destroy him, vulnerable to attack. When we are apart from God, a relationship with the God of the Bible, we are in danger of perishing in this world and for eternity, separated from him forever in a place called hell. And just like a lost coin, uh, what's it like to be lost? We, are, we miss out on our purpose. Like a lost coin. You know, that coin was out of circulation. It had no purchasing power. He, you, she, she could not buy anything with that coin. It was not fulfilling the purpose for which it was minted. And just the same, when you and I are lost from a relationship with the God of the Bible, we are outside of the purpose for which we have been created. We miss our reason for being here on this planet. It's tragic. We're in danger of perishing in this life and in eternity. We're in danger of missing out on our purpose, our meaning in this life. That's why so many people are searching for meaning. And and also... When we are lost, we are lost from a relationship, from fellowship, from closeness, from experiencing God, just like that lost son had broken off his relationship with his father. He had no benefit, no enjoyment, no interaction. But I've got good news for you. Jesus comes looking for us. Lost People who are lost from God matter to God. They matter to God greatly. For Jesus here is also represented in these three parables. He's represented by the shepherd. He's represented by the woman. He's represented by the good father. And so uh, Jesus is like a shepherd searching for a lost sheep. There's many of... Here, I don't know if they... You know, I've only lived on this side of the planet in this culture. I don't know how people think about this in other parts of the world, but many of us Westerners in North America, we speak in terms of I'm searching for God. I'm seeking for God. I don't know how good we are at that. I think I want to recommend to you thinking of it this way. God is searching for you. He is not passive. He is not seated somewhere deep in the forest that you, so that you have to hunt and find him. He is coming after you. He is pursuing you. He wants to find you. Uh, he is easy to be found. All you got to do is turn around because he is coming for you. He is active. He is intentional. He is loving. He is gracious. He will never give up. He will come after you to rescue you. He's just like the shepherd seeking a lost sheep. Now notice that this shepherd went after the one sheep that was missing. He left 99 and went after the one, just one. Now, some uh, people in business today would not be too concerned, overly concerned about a 1% loss. But the point of the parable here is the incredible love of the Savior, the incredible love of the shepherd in that he, he was not going to give up. He didn't know the condition of that sheep. For all he knew, the sheep had already been destroyed. He might just find a, a, a corpse. He might just find a body there, torn and uh, decaying. But he was going after him. Great love of the shepherd. Jesus loves you. He knows you. He knows where you are. He knows your name. Listen, you are not just a number. 
You are not just, you are not an accident. Uh, you are not lost in the crowd. You say, how could God keep up with, with billions of people on this planet? I don't know. He's bigger than us. He's smarter than us. He knows you by name. He, keep, he, has you on, he keeps you on his mind all the time. It's beyond our comprehension. But that's what he states here. And if we are lost to him, he is active and intentional. You see, Jesus is more, now listen closely. He's more concerned about people who are lost from him than those of you who are found people. <gasps> Wait a minute, are you saying he loves lost people more than me? No, I didn't say that. I said he's more concerned about people who are lost to him than people who are found. I mean, you're already found. You're already okay. You've been rescued. You've been reconciled. You've been restored to him. You've been celebrated in heaven. We're going to come to all that in just a moment. Your, he has, your sins have been forgiven. He's adopted you into his family. You are secure. No one or no thing can pluck you out of his hand at all. Um, you're, you have a savior in heaven. Your citizenship is in heaven. This is not all there is. One day you're going to spend eternity in heaven uh, with all the saints and our Lord and Savior uh, doing meaningful work in a joyful place and things that matter. It's going to be no more t tears, no more dying, none of this garbage, no more war. Man, you're okay. And you've already done that. You're okay. You're in the house. You are in the family, but somebody's not that he loves. And so he's way more concerned for them that are not yet found. So those of you who are seekers, those of you who are who are exploring faith, just know he knows you. He, he wants you. He's pursuing you. You can be found. He intends to do that, that very thing. He's like a doctor who spends most of his time with the sick. Do any of you get mad at your doc because he didn't just show up and drink coffee with you at the house every day? No, you expect him to be taking care of people who need him. Well, he is, he cares for the lost. Look at Luke 19, 10. The scriptures say, for the son of man has come to seek and save the lost. And you once were, and now you've been, been found. Uh, Jesus is not only like the good shepherd seeking the sheep. He's like the woman seeking after the lost coin. Now this coin was very important to the woman. Now, when we first read this parable, we think he just lost a coin, lost a nickel, lost a quarter, lost even 50 cents. You wouldn't spend much time looking for that. Not much, but she did. You say, what's the deal? Well, in the day of Jesus, 90% of the people on the planet were painfully poor. Painfully poor. Their, their vocation was trying to survive one more day. Get through the day. Have enough food for today. That one silver coin represented one day's wage. And in that day, it could mean the difference between living and dying, eating or not eating. Survival was uh, at stake. And um, so she was searching. Well, Jesus searches just like that. Like you matter. You matter. He diligently searches for us like a woman who lit a lamp and used some valuable oil and, and swept the house and searched every corner. He's searching for you. And Jesus is like the father looking for a lost, rebellious son. This father grieved that the son had departed every day. He looked down the road for him every day. He searched the horizon for him every single day day. And Jesus does that for you. It breaks his heart when we rebel against him and say, no, no, no. I, I'm going to be in charge of my own life. And we go our own way like sheep. He mourns for us. He loves us. He pursues us. But then, so what's it like to be found? Well, I want you to think back. Let's take a trip back. We get used to this and we forget. Uh, it's why I like to pray through Psalm 51, way down in there in about the middle of Psalm 51, David, the psalmist, after he'd repented and come back to God, he prayed that God would do something in his heart 
And it was this. He said, oh, Lord, uh, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Now, Lord, I'm praying that you do that for all the found people in this room and within my hearing on the patio and online right now. Would you think back to the day that you were astounded, that you got saved, that you received Christ, that you realized you had been forgiven and found and cleansed and you were okay with God and he took you back? Can you remember that day, where you were, who you were with? how that happened? Well, uh, what's that like? Well, Jesus gives us several words and they're all inadequate to describe this wonderful thing. Being found by Jesus is like being rescued. Write that down. It's like being rescued. Now the shepherd rescued the sheep from destruction and death. And when we are found by Jesus, he forgives and rescues us from the penalty of our sin from the power of sin over our daily lives. And one day he'll rescue us, deliver us from the very presence of sin when he makes all things new. It's like being rescued. It reminds me, now I've got to say, I I have so far in my life, I have never been in a situation where I felt like my my life was threatened, that I was lost and my life was in danger. Uh, and that I was, that I was going to be rescued, and then that I was rescued. I've never had that experience. Some of you have, haven't you? Anybody? You don't have to tell us about it. Got a few. Yep, got a few. And we've seen the story. I've never been lost at sea. Never been lost at sea. I, my dad was a young sailor in the Pacific Campaign in World War II, and He used to tell some stories about guys being lost at sea. I try to imagine what that was like. And then someone be found. Some of you Naval Academy grads that I'm seeing sitting around here, you could tell us some of the stories you've seen and heard. But I've not experienced that. I've never been lost in the woods, you know, only for about 15 minutes. And, uh, and, but not, certainly not for all of a sudden be lost for days and days and days and think I'm going to die. But then all of a sudden the, the the, uh, the the rescuers found me. I, I that that's not. I've never experienced that. Closest thing I've ever had to vividly was I sitting as a as a seventeen year old senior in high school and listening to my favorite cousin, who'd come home from Vietnam, tell me the horrifying story of uh, after a firefight in the jungles. Uh, being the only one left uh, in the jungle. And uh, how he had to hide and, and being searched for by the enemy and lying under, under bushes and things to survive for three days until one day until he heard the helicopter coming back to find him. And what that was like when he ran out of that jungle into that little clearing and was pulled up into the helicopter he was pretty happy about it he was pretty happy about it being found by Jesus is like being rescued it's like being rescued being found by Jesus is like being restored to our proper place that um, uh, some, some students of the ancient Middle East tell us that uh, women in that culture poor they would they had um headbands that could where silver coins could be placed and necklaces where they kept their coins i'm not sure that this woman had one of those but when she found the coin she was able to restore it to its pop, proper place and purpose uh when we are when we are restored saved by jesus we're restored to our purpose to our life becomes beautiful again and meaningful again. Uh, It's like being rescued. It's like being restored. It's like being reconciled, a broken relationship being reconciled. The prodigal son didn't think he would ever be reconciled to his father. Even when he came to his senses, said, I'm starving to death out here. I got to go home. The servants in my father's house have plenty to eat. He said, he'll never accept me again, though. I'll just be. And so he said, 
Oh, I'm, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just treat me as a servant. But the father said, no, no. When he saw him, he was filled with compassion. He ran him threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. Luke 15, 20 tells us. It's like being reconciled. Do you, uh, do you have any broken or bruised relationships in your life? I do. You know, I've shared with you before that one of my prayers, lifelong prayers, is that, that Lord would enable me somehow to, that I would be able to reconcile the, the, bro, the, the, the broken and bru- any broken and bruised relationships that I have in my life. I'm 71 years old now. How many of you in your 50s? If you, if you live as long as me, you've got 20 more years to mess up some other relationships. I mean, the longer you live, it's the easier it gets. Isn't it? Some of you folks that look to be a similar age as me, isn't that the truth? I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I, but there are some people who have deleted my photo from their phone. And, and I get it. But then there were some, there's been some others that were, we reconciled. Have you, ever, have you had that experience? Maybe, maybe it's with a spouse. Maybe it's with a, ch- a, a child or a parent or an aunt or an uncle or one of your friends in school. Or, oh, it, isn't it a wonderful, wonderful burden lifted from your heart when, those, when, you're, when broken and bruised relationships are healed, reconciled? <laughs> well, that's what happens when we're found. By Jesus, he, the Bible uses the, the, that language of being reconciled to God. We are fully accepted by God through faith alone in Christ uh, alone. And it's also like being celebrated. The son said to his father in Luke 15, 21 and following, Father, I've sinned against heaven and, and in your sight, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fatted calf and slaughter it and let's celebrate with a feast. Because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate, celebrate. And I love, uh, look back up in in verse seven. Jesus said, I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people or other who don't need repentance. People who've already repented. There's a celebration in heaven when we come, when we're reconciled to God through faith alone in Christ alone. There's a celebration. There's a big one. There's a big one. I want you to think back again to the day you were found and you realized you'd been found by Christ. Listen, when that happened, all of heaven hit the brakes. Hit the brakes. They rolled out a banner with your name on it. Everybody stood and shouted and praised God and thanked Jesus he, that he saved sinners like you and like me. And it hap- it's happening all the time all the time because every day around the planet, the spirit of God is finding people and drawing them to Christ and feel they're coming to faith and getting reconciled and rescued and put back together. It's magnificent. The hope of the world is Jesus. The hope of the world is Jesus. And he found most of you in this room. Some of you are explorers. And I just want you to know he can find you. If you just turn around, he's pursuing, he's right there. So why don't we pray and do that now? Join me. Let's pray together. For those of you who are already found by Christ, maybe you should pray something like this. Lord Jesus, thank you for being a good shepherd. Thank you for being like that woman searching for that coin. Thank you for being like that good father who never gave up on his son. Thank you. Thank you for these things. Thank you, Lord, that you come after me. Thank you for rescuing me from the penalty of sin. 
and the power of sin over my life. Thank you for restoring me to your family, adopting me into your family. Thank you for reconciling me fully that I am fully accepted by God the Father through my faith in you. And I don't ever have to worry about it again. And now those of you who are explorers, if you're in this room or you're online or you're out on the patio, why don't you come to faith in Christ? Why don't you come home like that prodigal son? Why don't you come back? In the book of Isaiah, God says, if we repent, if we turn around, he says, with open arms, I will welcome you back. Here's how you do it. First of all, you repent. Pray something like this, Lord, I admit that I have, I'm a rebellious person. I've been revolting against your rule over my life. And it is sinful. And I turn from it. I give up on me. And I turn to you. And I place my active trust in you. I believe you died innocently on the cross in my place making atonement for my sin and that you rose from the dead and are alive today to save me, to rescue me, to reconcile me, to restore me. And I ask you to come into my life as my Savior and forgive my sin. I ask you to come into my life as my Lord and my God and take control of me and my life and my eternity. And I will seek to serve you as long as I live by your grace and your help. And it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Olivia. We're now going to continue worshiping our Lord by observing the beautiful ordinance of the Lord's Supper. You should have received the elements uh, of, uh, for this ordinance uh, when you came in. Uh, if you happen uh, not to, if you'd raise your hand and would like elements, uh, our ushers are nearby with a basket They'll be sure to get those. Just raise them really high. Anybody here in the front? Anybody down on the floor? Anybody in the balcony? We got a few folks in the balcony. Yeah, hang on. They'll have to run to get to you there. There you go. <clears throat> if you are not yet a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, this would be a part of the service that you should refrain from participating in. For this is something that the Lord commissioned for only for his followers, only for believers. And if you are a believer, I'm going to give you a moment to join me in uh, following the admonition we have from God's word as we approach this time of worship that we should examine ourselves uh, to make sure that we are in the faith, to make sure if we are in the faith that we are uh, walking in, um, in fellowship and obedience with our Lord and Savior, and uh, to make sure that we are in good fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. If we find that we're not, we should seek reconciliation as we talked about earlier. <clears throat> so I want to give you a moment to pray, and then we will partake of the elements. Would you pray and examine yourself? Thank you for hearing our prayers, Lord Jesus. Now, the Bible says that on the night he was betrayed, that the Lord took bread uh, after supper. And after he broke it, he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, the scriptures say, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. <clears throat> and the scriptures say, for as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Pray with me. And so, Lord, we, we do. We, we thank you that you've given us these, this bread and this cup, these things we can see and touch and smell and taste uh, as physical reminders of your body that was broken for us, your blood that was shed for us, so that moral and spiritual foul-ups, just like me, could be rescued, could be restored, could be reconciled to you through faith in you. And Lord, we commit ourselves as individual followers and as a church, we will continue to proclaim the good news of your death, resurrection, and salvation that you offer to this world until the day that you return. Help us to do so. And it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.
came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Come on, let's sing that again. Then came the You may be seated. You may be seated. <clears throat> I'm going to ask our uh, prayer team, uh, made up of our elders and staff members and pastors, if you'd come take your places at the head uh, of each uh, aisle. Thank you. Um, if you need help applying this message you've heard today, or if you'd like to talk with someone more about how to commit yourself to the Lord Jesus, or if you need prayer for something, uh, our team members will be here across the front. Hey, I'm going to get you guys to shift one whole aisle down. That'll get us. Yeah, come on down. There we go. Peter, if you'd grab that one. Melody there. Yeah, these, these guys will be here um, as long as you need to talk or pray uh, with someone as soon as we dismiss the service. Now, if you have made a spiritual commitment, if you've prayed to receive Christ, if you've made a recommitment of your life to Christ, if you desire to go public with your faith by being baptized, or if you'd like to sign up uh, for the Belong class, our membership class here at Dogwood, you can do that now, and we'd like to know about it. You can use the Connect card in the chair pocket in front of you to let us know. You can also text the word NEXT, N-E-X-T, to the number you see on the screen, uh, and uh, that'll... Uh, let us know what's going on with you, and we will help you. We'll send you materials in the mail. We'll pray for you. We'll make the offer of one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one spiritual coaching or spiritual direction from one of our team members. We want to help, so let us know what's going on uh, with you. If you have personally prayed to receive Christ but never gone public with your faith by being baptized, you can do that this morning. Our team is, has everything you need at our baptistry out on the patio, uh, changing rooms, change of clothes, towels, everything to uh, uh, help you uh, celebrate your Christian baptism today. We had two adults go public with their faith by baptism uh, after the last service. Why don't you join them? Why don't you join them? And uh, you be sure to do that as well. Uh, the baskets are under the chair on the left end of each row. If you'd take those and pass those down, you can turn in your prayer requests. You can turn in your connect cards. You can turn in offerings. Our ushers will pick those up. And uh, as soon as they do, let's stand for our closing 
blessing. Would you join me? It's going to be on the screen from Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next weekend.